I don't know what it's like for you. I, I tend to say the same things often, and I say things in a strange way. Anyone else? Some things are grammatically incorrect. Some things you learned when you were young, and they just have stuck with you. And there are certain moments that I, with, you know, probably obnoxious predictability, say the same thing over and over again, so much so that the people in my life, my wife, my kids, those I work with, my friends, they always say, you always say that. Now, a couple examples would be, uh, you know, for me, when I am going through the grocery store and the cashier, you know, swipes an item across the counter and it doesn't ring up. Wave at me if that's ever been the case for you. They're ringing up all your order and they, the milk goes across the, the scanner or maybe it's those new blue jeans you're trying to buy. They go across the scanner and it doesn't ring up. I cannot fight the urge or the impulse to in that moment say, it must be free. Uh, I just, anyone, anyone else, you're balling on a budget? Yeah, you're just like, hey, that might be God's blessing in favor upon my life. I'm not trying to reject a blessing. That might be free. And every single time it happens, my kids are like, oh, don't say that it must be free thing. I find that when I get home from work some days, uh, I just have decision fatigue. Wave at me if you've ever had decision fatigue. It's like, if I have to make another decision. And I'll come in the door and Kristen will often ask me, hey, you know, what would you like for dinner? What would you like to do tonight? And uh, you know, for me, I, I'm pretty boring, pretty simple. I, I love sports, I like to read books and I just love chasing my wife. And I just find wherever she's at, that's just where I wanna be. And I've just been so blessed to be anchored to such a wonderful person. And so I often say, uh, it's your world, I'm just living in it. And you tell me it is your world, I'm just living it. I just wanna be right where you're at. And I just wanna flirt with you the entire day. And I can hear my kids and sense their eye rolls every single time, because now they're starting to understand flirting. And they're like, oh no, I see what he's doing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so I say the same thing over and over again. Uh, but one I probably say the most, the statement that uh, I say every single day in our household, I, I say often walking through the hallways of our offices is something I grew up hearing my dad say. And it's the statement, you ain't ready. Look at your neighbor and say, you ain't ready. Yeah, so I, I grew up with the father for who, whatever reason, he would just bake, bake anticipation into everything. He'd open up the door and flip on the lights and be like, oh, you ain't ready. You ain't ready for this day. You ain't ready for this test. You ain't ready for this game. Uh, Christmas would come around. You ain't ready to see what's in this present. Or we'd be going on vacation. Oh, you ain't ready to see your grandparents. Like he was always building anticipation to where me and my siblings were always on the edge of our seat. Like what is about to happen? Because he was always prepping us for readiness. My dad raised us. Uh, to be obnoxiously excited at all times. <laughs> Anyone else? And I will at times uh, do the same. And I do find often in this season, walking through the hallways of our church and at our different locations and spending time with uh, staff as well as lay leaders within the church and our different programs and projects and just sensing God doing uh, something really special in and through our church and what would happen if all of us just elevated our anticipation and in many ways, I feel like uh, every week I'm getting up here being like, you ain't ready, right? Like, just you wait what God can do uh, to see what he can do. I think when you jump into the book of Revelation, which is a series we've been in for the past few weeks, on um, the first few chapters of the book, you can sense uh, a very similar, urgent prompting uh, from John. If you're new to the book, John is one of the last remaining heroes. He was an original disciple in the original 12. He was also a part of the three that Jesus would at times single out for more leadership development. We find that it was John who was at the foot of the cross to which Jesus says, hey, would you look after my mother? John was not only one of the original disciples, he is arguably Jesus's closest friend. He got to witness a lot, see a lot. He knows Christ personally. He seen his death, witnessed his resurrection, and he gave his life to carrying forward the mission and the gospel uh, to anyone who would listen and who had yet to hear. And John is the last of these heroes. He is in his late 80s. 
Uh, he is in prison on an island called Patmos where he has been exiled to die. They tried to kill him. The Wiccan Roman Empire tried to do away with John and somehow he lived through all the torture and all the pain and they decided at this point, let's just put him in prison. And it is in that place, this is important to understand, that in that place of pain, in that place of perplexity, and in that place at the end of his road in such a dire confinement, he has an encounter and a vision with Christ. That's important for you to understand. Because a lot of times we think God is selective on which spaces he enters and which individuals he intervenes with. And there's not a space in your life, there's not a circumstance that you face, there's not a pain too great, there's not a space too small, there's not a situation too complex for our God to lean in and to do something profound and special and unique in and through our lives. It's living every single day knowing he is with me, he's for me, and even now, despite what I'm facing, I'm open and ready to experience more of my God. Come on, all the saints say amen. amen. It's, it's a, I understand this. And John has this vision, and we went through it in week one. You, you gotta go check it out. Not that the sermon was that good, but that the explanation is needed. That he has this vision of Christ. He turns and he says, I saw one walking among the lampstands. And he was you know, just this prolific and mesmerizing figure. And he goes into great detail from the way his hair looked to his eyes of burning fire to a tongue that looked like a double-edged sword to the robe as well as the burnished bronze feet. He puts Jesus in such vivid language that it can't help but jar your soul to think, who is this Christ? What is his purpose? And what kind of king and Lord have I anchored my life to? The first chapter of the book of Revelation, without a doubt, should have you standing back in wonder and awe, thinking, that's my king. And we live in a world, we live in a culture, in fact, we live in a pretty significant moment in time uh, where a lot of people are settling for lesser kings. And John writes this letter and he, he starts, you know, Christ says, hey, I, I wanna send these words to the church. And he sends these seven letters to seven churches, which would be in what we know as modern day Turkey. And these letters were written by a pastor to a real church, but they are also meant to be letters, timeless letters, available and uh, pointed to all churches throughout human history. And this is a lot of information, but each letter begins in the same fashion. John writes to the church in Ephesus or to the church in Smyrna and to the church in Thyatira, which we're gonna look at today. And after this salutation, he references the vision. Now, hang with me on this, because this is important. He references the vision. In other words, identity always shapes activity. You have to remember the vision of Christ because he's going to apply that vision to your circumstance. Maybe here's one way to think about it. A clear vision of Christ will often help you discern the version of Christ you are about to experience or are experiencing. One of the great challenges in spiritual maturity is learning to discern God's activity in your life. Okay, well, what's your vision of this God of ours? And that will help you understand the version that you are experiencing. Now, hear me quickly. What I'm not implying, in fact, it would be heresy to act or say that there are multiple versions of Christ. There are not multiple versions of Christ. There's only one Christ. What I'm saying is he's always good. He's always powerful. He's always wise. He's always just. He's always merciful. He's always a source of logic and truth. He's always a source of peace. Your circumstances... Your conduct, your decision, your environment will often determine the version of God you're going to experience. I have this vision that helps me discern the version. Some of you, you're battling illness, and in this season, you are praying, hoping, and anticipating that you are gonna have an encounter with the great physician. Some of you, life is confusing. You have some tough decisions to make, 
And once more, you're thinking of the wonderful counselor that is available in Christ. That's the version you need. For others, it is crippling lack. It is the, you know, the, the need for provision. And it's once more of having a vision of God that understands he is Jehovah Jireh. He is my provider. I have a vision of God and it helps me understand the version of God I'm going to experience or need to pray uh, that I encounter. Is that making sense? Show thumbs if it's landing across the room at all of our campuses. Okay, yeah. And that is what you find in every letter to the churches. To the church in Ephesus, uh, Ephesus, these are the words of the one who walks among the lampstands. To the church in Smyrna, these are the words of the one with the double-edged sword as his tongue. Tracking with me? And those vision pieces uh, really help us understand his activity. So now here comes the next letter. It says, to the angel of the church in Thyatira, right? These are the words of the son of God, whose eyes, here it is, are like a blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Okay, so that was a part of the original vision. He says, I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Okay, so pump the brakes there for a second. Again, he gives us this vision. These are the words of the one with blazing eyes and whose feet are burnished in bronze. And we talked about the purpose and the, the meaning of these images. The blazing eyes mean these are the words of the one who sees everything, knows everything, there's nothing in your life that you can keep secret from God. There's nothing in your life that you can hide from God. And I know that type of message comes for many with fear, timidity, anxiety. Anyone else nervous? Like, wait a second, he has what type of information on me? Because if anyone else in your life had that type of information, uh, you would either be canceled or they would be running in the other direction. That is much of what is at work behind some of this cancel culture. I think some need to be held accountable, but culture has jumped on board with it, and we are just turning history into weaponry, and we are disguising our hatred as accountability. He's saying, hey, these are the words of the one who sees, and here's the good news. Here's the gospel. The one who knows you the best knows everything about you. The one who knows you the best loves you the most. He doesn't run, he doesn't retreat, he doesn't turn a blind eye. He leans in full of mercy, full of love, full of commitment, long suffering and uh, forbearance of saying, I'm committed to you, I'm all in. These are the words of the one who sees as well as the one who stands. These are the words of the ones whose feet are like burnished bronze. And what did we talk about in week one? That means our God is immovable and nothing bumps him off his stance. He doesn't change his mind. He doesn't waffle to peer pressure. And he certainly isn't influenced by arrogant children coming up in a culture who think that they can bump him off his stance. And I'd say that strong word is for all of us millennials on down. We're not the first generation to think that this God is waffling and that we can bump him off his stance. No, these are the words of the one who is immovable, whose stance is, I mean, it's an unshakable reality. And the good news of that is, well, why wouldn't you want to anchor your life to someone who loves you that greatly, who is that firmly set in his stat, a stance and foundation. Many are walking around with a shaky life, wobbly life, and discovering firsthand that they have built their life on a foundation that is immovable and shakable. And John says, yeah, but not those of us who surrender our life to Christ. These are the words of the one who sees and the one who stands. And folks, and young people, please just hear me on this. I know sometimes I come after you like a coach. Um, 
just know you can give the rest of your life to trying to dismantle, disprove, or discredit this God. Uh, but when your life comes to an end, he'll still be standing, resolute and immovable, ready to face the next generation. He says, these are the words of the one who sees and stands. And he says, I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance. Now, for the person who wants to go deeper in their faith, uh, we're gonna geek out for a second. The rest of you just hang tight. If you're looking to say, hey, how do I understand scripture better? How can I make my study of scripture more enjoyable or thought provoking? Or what is something we can do as an exercise in our life group together? What you will find in scripture is the pattern or tendency to link to virtues or behaviors. Love and faith, service and perseverance. In the story of creation, you find that God tells Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. When God is often described or referred to, it is that he is just and merciful. And it is understanding how when scripture does that, it is inviting us to understand that these two concepts are mutually reinforcing. Okay, so if you think of love and faith, and I, and I know I'm coming in at you, but listen, love and faith, they're mutually reinforcing. Love or faith is the foundation of love. What is the source of love in our life? Well, we believe that God is love, perfect, unlimited, unconditional love, that he loves us not because of who we are, but because of who he is. He is magnificent and it is our experience of this love and our adherence to God and our faith in him uh, that our experience produces an expression. Our faith is the foundation of our love. And our love is the evidence of our faith. How do you know someone is truly in relationship with Christ? They're loving. <laughs> A cruel Christian is quite an oxymoron. And he says, I know your deeds, your love and faith. So here's one thing to consider. I like creating a quadrant when this happens. So maybe you've seen something like this. So with your life group or maybe by yourself, what you could do is say, you could put love up here and you could put faith over here, or you could put service up here or, and perseverance over here. Now let's do the last one that maybe... Give an example. If you say up here represents high service and high perseverance, which would mean here would be low service, low perseverance. And then what I like to do is just pick a random letter to make it challenging and say, assign a word or label to each quadrant. So yesterday I asked Presley, I said, Presley, give me two letters. And her name is Presley. So she said L and E. I said, okay, let's work with L and E. I would say someone who is of high service and high perseverance, I would label that quadrant legacy. Those are the individuals who actually do impressive things. They are individuals who add value and understand the importance of living beyond yourself and serving others. And they, they do it in season and out of season. When times are good and when times are bad, it's just who they are. And those are the type of people who get down the road and you realize what a legacy. Well, yeah, because they understood the importance of serving other people and they just never gave up. It's a legacy. If you look to this side, you say, okay, well, this quadrant is someone who is high service, but low perseverance. I would label that quadrant as learning. These are individuals who are learning how to live out a higher standard on a more consistent basis. Individuals who have the right intuition, the right instinct, oh, I should serve others. They just don't have the right character to support it or the right values that shape their behaviors or the right disciplines to facilitate it daily in their life. And so it's someone who's learning how to do that. Well, if you go to this category and you say, well, what would you say of someone who is low service and low perseverance. I would say that person is lethargic. And I really, 
have a hard time reasoning with that quadrant of people. I think lazy people are crazy people, and I don't know how to reason well with them. The last category, high perseverance, low service, I would maybe say letdown. I would label that category as a letdown. Clearly, this is a high capacity person who has the strength and the courage to not quit and to stick with something. They just haven't attached their capacity to significance. They have not lent their giftings. They have not lent their time or their energy to adding value beyond themselves. And folks, I'm telling you, a narcissistic, selfish approach to life is such a boring, unproductive, and just bland way of living. God's work in your life and God's work in my life is tied to God's work in someone else's life. And so you just start to think, how do I understand these things? And he's saying, when I look at this church in Thyatira, Christ says, I see legacy-minded people. He says, I see people who are faithfully living on mission and despite what comes their way, they're sticking with it. And I get a sense in this season that uh, God recognizes many of the same individuals in our church. And I love what he says to them at the end. He says, I know your deeds and you are now doing more than you did when you first began. Jesus, who is the author, the perfecter, the finisher of life, Jesus, who I believe is the full, perfect standard of what it means to be human, looks at a group of people and says, hey, I can see your progress. Man, words carry weight when they come from a good source. And the source and standard of life looks at a group of imperfect people going through trials and he says, but don't lose heart. I can see your progress. The challenge is most people can't see their own progress. It's not that God can't see how far you've come. Chances are you can't see how far you've come. We have this tendency to obsess over what's in front of us and we're always aware of the gap between where we're at and where we're trying to be. We're always striving, we're always reaching for the next thing and we're always aware of the, the, the space between our desires and our reality. And what we fail to do is pump the brakes, pivot and turn around and realize the gap between you and the former bondage or foolishness or whatever challenge you walk through and how much God has done in your life to bring you to where you're at. That you may not be where you wanna be, but by the grace of God, you are where you shouldn't be or could be, right? It's, it's because of God's grace, I've, I've somehow landed in a place and I'm somehow progressing in my relationship with God in a way that is, is pretty impressive. And some of you need to learn how to encourage yourself and make sure you put points on the board and pat yourself on the back uh, the next time you stay faithful in a tough situation. Christ says, I, I know your progress. And church, I, I think he would come to many of you and say, I know your progress. Like you're doing well. And many in our church are, are doing well, it's amazing. He goes on to say this, nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. And by her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. And here's the part where people are like, wait a second. Pastor, when we jumped into this, you said, 
If you read the book of Revelation and it doesn't put some hope within your heart, a smirk on your face and some steel within your spine, you're not reading it well. Well, after reading that, I don't feel a smirk rising up on my face. There's a lot in there to be like, whoa, this is strong language. And again, as a community, the question has to always be, what do we do with a hard conversation? What do we do with the hard word? And are we the type of community that can sit in dialogue with our heavenly father on meaningful matters? Or are we just lacking the maturity to sit at that table? What do we do with the hard conversation? And here you have John once again name dropping. Last week, he was like, oh, you've given yourself over to Balaam and the teachings of Balak, and you are doing what the Nicolaitans did. Okay, pause. Who were those guys? And here he comes out and he says, you have a Jezebel leading people astray with false teaching. And the question is, who is Jezebel? And folks, homegirl was nuts. She was nuts. And you read of her story in the Old Testament. You find that King Ahab is leading Israel. Jezebel is a Phoenician princess. And there is this marriage that is obviously politically advantageous to both. And the arrangement moves forward. And immediately, Jezebel begins to indoctrinate the people of God, the nation of Israel. She begins to indoctrinate introduce all this idolatry and all of this immorality. And as she's doing so, what's the biggest threat to indoctrination? Independent thinking. <laughs> what's the biggest threat to indoctrination? People who know how to think reasonably for themselves. Well, she looks at the culture and she looks at the nation of Israel. And she says, well, who is running against the grain? of my agenda. And do you know who it was? The prophets. This is where in the Old Testament you have Ahab and Jezebel squaring off with Elijah. It's one of the greatest stories in the Bible. Elijah stands on top of a mountain and Jezebel has created this alliance with the, the prophets of Baal a group of individuals known for witchcraft and sorcery, and she forms this alliance to try to take out the prophets of God. And I love it because Elijah thinks to himself, game on, let's compare our gods. <laughs> Next time someone starts to criticize your faith, just project doubt onto the God you serve. Think to yourself, game on. Let's compare gods, please. What are you bringing to the table? What claims can your God make? What has he done in the world? What has he done in your life? How is he gonna save you? Please, let's compare gods. <laughs> We're too insecure when we fail to recognize we stand anchored to the one who sees and the one who stands and the one who's gone before us. And Elijah says, let's compare gods. The prophets of Baal gather together and the task is to see who can call down fire to burn up an altar. And these prophets begin to do a bunch of strange and goofy things. They start to try to manufacture this end result on their own and they discover they are unable to do so. And what you have is just a group of people standing in a place, hurting themselves, doing a bunch of goofy things. I'm no sociologist, but when I look at the world, I can't help but think and see a group of people hurting themselves, doing a bunch of goofy things. And Elijah says, throughout it, well, maybe your God is taking a nap. Maybe he's out for lunch. I love Isaiah, uh, Elijah because he's such a trash talker. Anyone appreciate a good trash talker? Not like the, the one who is perverted or just knows how to say profanity. The one who is clever with their trash talk. Makes you have to run back and think, what did he just say to me? Elijah says, 
All right, my turn. And he has them get a bunch of water and he has them soak the altar. Why? He's stacking the odds against his God. And he says, my God uh, can even light a blaze an altar soaked in water. Let's compare gods. And John is writing the church and saying, hey, you need to know that there is a uh, Jezebel dynamic at place among you. And it is coming about by false and wonky teaching that is allowing things to creep into the body of believers that is creating a moral decay that ultimately will lead to collapse the way we see it in the days of Old Testament. And he makes this statement. It's actually a a very tender, merciful statement. God says in the letter, I have given her time to repent, but she has refused to turn from her ways. And he's, he's calling an entire church to examine themselves, to recognize their need for repentance, recognize their need for uh, his work in our life, as well as recognize their faulty tendency to tolerate and accommodate the wrong things. He says, you tolerate this. And we live in a culture and a society where tolerance has become a highly esteemed and celebrated virtue. And to be very clear, I think as Christians, 100%, we should always be gentle and mindful in our approach and slow to speak and always kind and always loving and always graceful and always patient and just always uh, you know, affirming the dignity of every individual we ever come in contact with. We, we should love and reflect Christ at all times. But there is a form of tolerance that takes it too far. And I think we live in times where we have taken this too far. I love what G.K. Chesterton said. He said, tolerance is the virtue of the man without convictions. What's interesting about Thyatira is Thyatira was a border town and it was a military town. Well, what do those two things have in common? Well, of course, every nation around the globe understands the importance of guarding a boundary. And he writes this letter to a group of believers and he says, all right, in your community, you should know this the best. You should understand the importance of guarding a boundary. And folks, I I just, I think as the people of God, we cannot forget the importance of guarding a boundary. God's boundaries for your life are God's blessings for your life. He's not trying to be some cosmic killjoy. He is showing you this is how you live in true freedom. That's bondage. And he says, I have given her time to repent yet you continue to tolerate this. Folks, what you tolerate, you help create. And that idea of extending time for repentance is a beautiful thing. And I love how St. Augustine said it. He said, God has promised forgiveness to your repentance, but he has not promised tomorrow to your procrastination. I mean, why not live with an urgency behind your humility and repentance? Just just for the record, repentance is not a one-time deal. You give your life to Christ today, you're gonna wake up tomorrow to discover you still got some broken tendencies. Come on, wave at me, saints, if you woke up the next day and figured out, oh, I still got some work to do in my life. Heaven didn't wave a wand over me. Yeah, I walked out of hell, but I still smell like smoke. Right, salvation gets you to heaven sanctification gets heaven through you. Salvation, it happens in a moment. Sanctification will take the rest of your life. You wake up the next day in sanctification. It's a process. But some of you, you know, you know that what you are banking your life upon is faulty. And why? 
gamble with your future? Why gamble with your purpose? Why gamble with your potential? Why gamble with any of it? when there is a clearly set apart God from any other option in the world. This is where you have to do your own research. Please don't take my word for it. Academically say, let's compare the gods. And he says, I will make her lie on a bed of suffering. Now I understand there, there's kids in the room and I'm a parent as well, so we'll keep this high level. But here is a woman who, a situation that immorality has crept in and God's design is being perverted. And what he's saying now, think about this, this is a wild thing. He's saying, what should have been a pleasure for you is now gonna become a pain for you. What was meant to be pleasurable and intimate is now going to be painful And that's a quickening. That is a quickening. Whoa, what do we do with the hard word? And watch how he ends. He says, now, I say to the rest of you, in Thyatira, you who do not hold on to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets. Bleh, right? Like this idea of like acting so smart, acting as if there's knowledge beyond your grasp and there's this elitism that, oh, you just don't know. Yeah, the wickedness of the world will only overcomplicate things to muddy the water. And the moment it seems over your head, they make you think you're dumb. That's the deep secrets of Satan. It's muddy water. The gospel comes with simplicity and clarity. I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received authority from my father, I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear what the spirit says to the churches. He says, yeah, this is going on. But some of you, you're remaining faithful. And Christ is saying, yeah, don't quit. You remain faithful. You stay to the course. Don't quit. And he says, and to the one who does, I will give them the morning star. He says, I don't place any other burden on you. That's that's again, that's such a thing of grace that Jesus shows up on the scene in the gospel and he says, hey, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Christ is saying, no, I'm not trying to make life hard on you. I'm not trying to place another burden on you. Just hold on to what you have. Jesus is coming to a church and he would come to us the same and he would say, what you have is enough. What you have is enough. A pardoned sin, a conquered grave, an unblemished savior, a relationship with Christ, what you have is enough. A library of 66 books, divinely inspired, that is infallible and inerrant and is God's written revelation for humanity. What you have is enough. The same power that conquered the grave, the same power that lifted a dead man back from his horrific slumber and into life and into eternity lives and resides in every single one of us who call upon the name of Christ. What you have is enough. Hold on to what you have and just stay anchored to the one who sees and the one who stands. And he says, and to the person who does not quit. Someone say, that's me. me. Come on, all of our camps to say, that's me. To the person who does not quit, that's me. 
I will give the morning star. Oh, what an image. Wave at me if you like looking at stars. Yeah. When do you look at them? In the evening. This is the great paradoxical approach to writing that you see all throughout scripture. I was talking to my daughter about this. We, I'm trying to force classic literature onto my kids and they're not buying it. And so we're having this, this conversation about Shakespeare who I don't fully understand. So please don't overestimate my reading. Uh, I'm trying to appreciate him because some people say he's the best ever and I just don't get it. And um, so Riley and I were talking about Romeo and Juliet and Shakespeare and how he is constantly laying out a paradox. What makes him a great writer is he captures in all of his characters uh, emotional complexity and inner conflicts. He makes you think differently about a broader idea. The morning star. Well, here's another question. Is the morning star the first star in the sky or the last star in the sky? Yes. What he's saying is, is if you stay with it, what you will hold on to is not just a glorious new day, but a light that is remarkable, a light that is unparalleled, and that light is Christ. The morning star represents Christ. And he says, guys, that, that's the goal. You stay with it. You don't quit. What's your prize? You get Jesus. And if that doesn't fill you with excitement, you don't get Jesus. You don't understand how wonderful he is. And I think John is, he's coming to a church and he's like, listen, yeah, homegirl's nuts, all that stuff is taking place. You don't quit and just you wait because what I seen in my vision is mesmerizing. And I think John would tell the church in Thyatira and I think he would tell our church and the church in America to this day, you ain't ready because what happens next, I believe God is gonna amaze us, amen. It's living every day with anticipation. Bring it on. I'm not quitting. Amen.